Hi, thanks for joining me tonight for Wednesday Online Bible Study. I'm glad you're here and I hope you've had a blessed week. Let me just take a moment to say thank you for your prayers, your calls, your texts, for checking in on us. My husband and I have been feeling stronger and better each and every day. I recorded this video on Saturday, which is day 17 of our quarantine, and we have been feeling good these past couple of days. So thank you for your prayers. God is so good, and all the time God is good. And I just want to encourage anybody out there, if you are sick, if you're struggling with some health issues, struggling with some hardships, know that God sees you, He hears you, and He will heal you, and He will bring you through in victory, whatever you're going through. Because our God is love, our God is hope, our God is strength, our God is our healer, our God is our everything. Amen. So hang on to God because He's all we've got. Amen. Amen. Well, are you ready to get started with our devotions tonight? We're going to be looking into the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And tonight's topic is, you are a wonderful testimony. Amen. Our life can be such a wonderful and powerful testimony for Christ, right? The American author Mark Twain, he wrote these words, Let us endeavor so to live that when we come to die, even the undertaker will be sorry. To paraphrase that, live your life so that when you die, even the funeral director will cry at your service. Or as I've heard some pastors say, live right so that I don't have to lie at your funeral, right? Our lives can be a powerful testimony for Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's look here at our key verse in 1 Thessalonians 1.3. It says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me give you some background. Paul, during his second missionary journey, established a church in Thessalonica. But while he was there, he was met with some Jewish hostility. We're told in Acts chapter 17 that there were some Jews who were jealous and that they went out there and they rounded up some bad characters. They started a mob and they created a riot. And it became so intense that Paul had to leave. He was forced to leave Thessalonica. And his concern was that the church, because it was still in its infancy, was not going to be strong enough to stand firm through it all. So some time passed and he sent Timothy, his helper, to go check in on the church in Thessalonica. And Timothy comes back with a report. And because of this report, this is where we have Paul write this letter to the Thessalonians. So let's read here the first seven verses of Thessalonians. He says, To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So from his opening words, we can see here that the church did indeed stand firm through opposition. And here they were as he wrote about their work in faith, their labor in love, and their endurance in hope. Amen. Their faith in Christ influenced their actions and they had become a model to all believers. Amen. And Paul goes on to tell them that they're loved by God and that he has chosen them. They had welcomed the gospel truth into their hearts and because it came with power from the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. So even as they had to endure severe suffering, they did it with joy. Now, some words that caught my eye, deep conviction. How would you describe a deep conviction? Because we all have them, right? The dictionary describes it as a strong persuasion or a belief or a state of being convinced. No matter what has been told to you, you've already made up your mind deep down inside and you are standing in that conviction because you believe that to be the truth. We all have deep convictions, right? There are voices here and there, opinions here and there, facts here and there. And maybe even as children, we were instilled with some deep beliefs that, that we just cannot change because they're just firm, deep convictions. 
And we hear people all around us voicing their deep beliefs as well. The world is eager to tell us how we should be, how we should think, but you and I have to resist that temptation to conform to the way the world is, right? Our lives should be patterned after God and His Word. Rather than being influenced by the world, we need to be influencers to the world, right? Do you realize that there is truly only one deep conviction that really matters? It is that strong persuasion. It is that firm belief. It is that state of being convinced that we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. The Apostle Paul also wrote in Corinthians, he said, His love compels us that we are convinced that Christ died for all. Amen. That's the deep conviction that matters, is that we know who God is. We know the truth. Amen. When our hearts are convinced of the truth that's found in Jesus, our lives will reflect the life of Jesus. Amen. This is what Paul was telling the church of Thessalonica. You are a wonderful testimony in Christ because you've grown in your faith, you've shared the gospel message with all, and you are imitating Christ. Amen. Let's look here at what he says in verses 8 through 10. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Amen. And this is the same message for us today. What a wonderful testimony your life is in Christ. Amen. Because you are deeply convicted of the truth and your life reflects it. Amen. The Apostle Paul also gave the Church of Thessalonica some words of wisdom, and they stand true as firm reminders for us today. Let's look here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as human words, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe embrace God's Word, accept God's Word, receive God's Word. God's Word is not human words. These are the very words of God. And we know that God's Word is working in us. Hebrews 4.12 reminds us, the Word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's Word is actively working in us, and we've got to embrace it. We've got to receive it. We've got to accept it. Amen? If we neglect His Word, our personal walk with God is going to be affected. And you know where it'll be most obvious? In our attitudes and in our actions. Because no longer is that deep conviction there that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All of a sudden, that's not going to be our deep conviction. That's not going to be our deepest conviction. And it'll be evident in the way we live. So embrace it. Never let it go. Embrace God's word. They are the very words of God. And they are life to our hearts. And they are actively working in us. Amen. Amen. Number two, persevere in love. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, We speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, we're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. Paul was reminding them here that everything they did was to please God. They didn't come using flattery and words. They didn't come in greed. But he reminded them in verses 7 and 8, he said, Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So let us persevere in love with one another. Let's care for one another. Let's love one another. And most importantly, let's share the gospel with others. It is a delight to share the gospel truth with others. Amen. Persevere also means to be persistent. 
A sister in our church was sharing after how years of trying, she was finally able to lead her uncle to the Lord. Amen. What a day of rejoicing that was in heaven. Don't give up on people. People will one day realize they need God and you'll be there to lead them to him. Amen. Be persistent. Persevere in love. Share the gospel. It's a delight. Amen. And number three, persevere in hardships. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. Paul realized that the church had suffered at the hands of their own countrymen, their own fellow Jews. And because of the suffering they had faced, they continued in their work of faith, in their labor of love, and in their endurance and hope. Amen. Many of you are facing tough hardships out there, and you may feel like it's just too much to bear. But I encourage you tonight, stand firm in that deep conviction that you have within you that tells you and reminds you of this. If God is for me, who can be against me? No, in all these things, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. Amen. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Praise God. I will never be shaken. I will not fear bad news because my heart is steadfast trusting in you, O Lord. My heart is secure. Amen. That's that deep conviction that we know God is who he says he is. Our God is our healer. Our God is our strength. Our God is our hope. Our God is our joy. Our God is our everything. Our God is the one who fights our battles. Amen. So whatever you're going through, you put yourself that deep conviction in those promises of God that he will see you through. Amen. Amen. I want to close tonight with a prayer that is for all of us. And this is a prayer that the apostle wrote to the church of the Ephesians. But it's such a beautiful prayer. We've read it before, but I want to read it again. It says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Your life is a wonderful and powerful testimony in Christ. Amen. So live it in the fullness of God. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. See you next week.